Thank you, Dr. Shepard, for setting us up to shift into this morning's moderated discussion portion. Um, what we'll do is we'll take about 40 minutes to allow the group to talk together, and then we'll have time for about 20 minutes of audience questions. When we come to that time, if you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand. And then if you're selected, wait for one of the mic runners to get to you so that we can get the question out to the people on the video conference. So our moderator for this morning is Dr. Steve Sandage. He comes to us from Bethel Seminary in Minnesota. He's professor of marriage and family studies there and a counseling psychologist. His current work is in Forgiveness and Relational Spirituality with an upcoming publication through APA. He spent a delightful day with us at the Danielson last spring, and it's good to have him back with us again to moderate this morning's group. Well, I appreciate the three of you opening up so much of yourselves and what you care about and, and your work to us. I think it would be helpful to start out by just hearing a bit from each of you of what, uh, what struck you, what surprised you, what grabbed your attention from one another's presentations here in person, which is different than reading on paper. And uh, we'll start with you, Dr. McWilliams. May I make a housekeeping request first? Am I the only one who's really cold? <laughs> Is there something we can do about that? I usually dress light because it's often hot on stages, but I'm shivering here, so I thought I'd say that first. OK, then it's not just my feeling in awe of what I'm hearing. <laughs> um, I guess uh, the thing I'm most struck by, I had read Dr. Hoffman's um, response to my work. I had not read Dr. Shepard's. And I'm very struck that Dr. Hoffman reacted as another um, white middle class female, although I know your background is much more complicated than that as a person whose family was Egyptian and converts to Christianity and um, so forth. But, she focused on my suffering, and Dr. Shepard focused on my privilege and my status in a sort of mainstream majority. Um, and I, since this is the first time I've heard what you had to say, my, I had a lot of associations. I, I was remembering growing up thinking that I didn't have ethnicity and uh, envying people who had ethnicity because, you know, I was this really white bred person. Not only was I sort of upper middle class, suburban, white, heterosexual, um, I, I also was sort of absolutely average height and weight and didn't have any physical disabilities or deformity. I mean, I, I, was, I passed in almost every situation. And you're right, I felt like I was quite welcome in a mainstream church. Um, I later sort of uh, learned a lot about the Scots-Irish, which is the dominant ethnicity that I do represent, and recognized myself in a lot of the descriptions of people of that ethnicity. But when you are in the majority, you don't even think about some of the ways in which you are very specific. Um, I remember when the feminist movement came along, I thought, oh boy, I have something that <laughs> I've been oppressed about <laughs> that I wasn't really in touch with. Because as you may sort of have discerned from my history, um, I was lucky in having a very non-sexist family. Um, my parents were very egalitarian. My father did a lot of the housework. Um, he had lost his mother young and deeply respected and admired women, wasn't trying to get out from under uh, women. So um, it, it was um, an eye-opener to me to find 
to hear the stories of some of my female male friends who had been raised in families where, for example, their brothers had been allowed to go to college and they had not. Um, and it's a, it's a constant sort of theme of my um, development, personally, to learn more about other people, but in that process, learn more about myself, and including finding these surprising pockets of leftover buy-in to the majority perspective. Like a few years ago, um, one of my students from India did, boy, I'm still cold, that's why I'm trembling, um, did a doctoral dissertation on Hindus and how easy it was to misunderstand somebody who'd been brought up Hindu as being borderline because some of the, um, the habits of thought that you get from having a multiplicity of gods can look like splitting off of certain things. Um, and I remember reading her paper and, and noticing in myself this reaction of, wow, they still believe that shit? They really believe that stuff, <laughs> you know? As if I were the English, oh, thank you. <laughs> The English colonizer, you know, looking at the quaint customs of this uh, denigrated group. I think one of the things that is very interesting in talking about religion and diversity is um, that religious identity, as well as most kinds of identity, has some elements of a contrasted other, you know do not as the Philistines do, right? So that, how to um, feel an identity which is of necessity uh, has a contrast class without the hierarchical buy-ins that come with that, I think is a constant um, struggle. Uh, I also, I also think I'm kind of welcoming the chance to talk about race, gender, sexuality, because it's been a constant interest of mine. The backstory to my having met my husband at Oberlin was that as a sophomore in high school, I had moved to this Pennsylvania Dutch community, which was predominantly ethnically German, and there was a lot of anti-Semitism in it. There, there was a very small school. There was only one Jewish kid in my class, and the guys used to put swastikas on his gym locker. And I was horrified by this, coming from New Canaan, where the anti-Semitism had been very subtle <laughs> but, and not obvious to me, to seeing it so um, starkly. I got very interested in that issue of diversity. And for a, um, for a project in, I think it was civics, we were asked to write a paper on um, a social problem. So I picked anti-Semitism, and I went to the high school library and said, who writes about anti-Semitism? And the librarian said, well, Carrie McWilliams writes about minorities, and handed me Brothers Under the Skin which was my father-in-law's, my eventual father-in-law's book on race, which was one of the sources that they cited in the Brown versus the Board um, decision. So I was also very interested in race because of my love for the woman who had cared for me as a kid. And um, when I went to Oberlin, I recognized the name Carrie McWilliams. It was, it was my father-in-law's son. Um, but I was told that he was a, not only a radical from Berkeley, but that he was dating a black woman. And this was 1963. And I thought, oh boy, this sounds like just the kind of person I want to meet. Um, and you hear in that the kind of, I think, my, a combination of curiosity and also that sort of privilege attitude of, um, oh good, I get to learn from my advantage position something about people 
who are in these dis disadvantaged positions. My, my father-in-law had spent his whole career writing about minorities. He was the first person to write about the injustice of the Japanese internment and um, one of the first pe person to write a book on Chicanos and um, other minorities, Inuits, for example. Uh, and his book, A Mask for Privilege, was a book about anti-Semitism. So there's some way in which it became part of my uh, ego ideal that I was very interested in all kinds of issues of diversity. And there's so much privilege. And oh, was I out? I'm in now. How much sort of the assumption of a privileged majority position still permeates my story. So that, that's what I'm bouncing off in terms of my response to um, your comments. And I think I'll stop there and see what else came up. A lot of responses and reactions to um, to your paper, which of course I, I see Nancy's, but but not yours, and and um, I think that what flashed through my mind was one of my very earliest memories as a child, in that we were a minority in a Jewish community. My father was Syrian, and my mother was Egyptian. Um, being in uh, kind of a, a, a position of not feeling as, uh, as good as, though I was very accepted by that community. Our table always included everyone, and I always grew up that way. And my, one of my earliest memories is my father, who worked in leather goods, made this beautiful little wallet for me uh, that was yellow, and he hand did this stitching on the side. And uh, we were very connected with the African-American community there because my father did itinerant preaching. And um, we had a family over, and the lady was mentioning that she had no wallet. And it was just, in our family, that's the way we were. I gave her my, my new wallet. But as I thought about, well, why did I come up with that thought? Am I feeling somehow that I needed to, to defend that I was not one of the people that was in some way um, prejudiced or biased? And I thought, ooh, that's, that really is where we get to when, uh, when we move away from a third of the religious values that we supposedly hold to. And you came to that at the end of the paper. You, you clearly uh, articulated what to me really was a connection with what I was saying as well, which is we're all made in the image of God. And that if we really are living that value, then the, the complementarity, as Jessica Benjamin talks about, uh, really is, is something that gets addressed because it's not the seesaw of your suffering and my suffering, but it is we are broken and loved um, by, by God. Um, my second reaction was, I, I'm at NYU postdoc, and uh, what you shared was what is around me all the time. It is the air I breathe. In fact, right now, the relational psychoanalysis um, group is having a whole conference worldwide on race. Um, Jessica Benjamin, Adrian Harris, um, uh, um, these, these people have spoken on and race and gender. And I learned so much coming into that community that coming from a fairly conservative uh, Christian background, I needed to hear but had not, had not been exposed to. Um, the one point that, that you made um, that I think is really important and we have to wrestle with is um, kind of a, a, um, a strike at this idea of suffering makes you stronger. But then the question arises of 
okay, what about this redemptive thing of now we can have empathy for others? It seems that it can almost be a contradiction. Mm. So, you know, I, I think that the, the linkage there is that none of us will escape being broken in one way or another. It is how we create meaning out of that brokenness that is our choice. It is not that we pursue suffering and, uh, and applaud it, because that is what will make us uh, better instruments. It is we all fall in this very broken world. And if our fallenness can in some way cause the rising up of someone else, then that is the kind of transformation and redemption that uh, I believe we want to inspire our our patients to have, and uh, I want to embrace for myself. I have multiple thoughts going through my head right, right now. One of the things that struck me, you, you mentioned um, upon hearing your paper, did, you know, did I have a different reaction than when I read it in solitude and mm. wrote, and what I remembered um, when I heard you giving the paper, uh, there were certainly points of similarity um, that actually are in the longer version, but I actually thought I put in this shorter version for today, and that had to do with the piece around mourning, early mourning. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought about that, and I, I thought of, as you were speaking, and I also thought about it, because I am who I am, in terms of what is the mourning that occurs around race and gender when we oh. begin to think about these things. I, um, I think that's something that we could wrestle with. Um, mm -hmm. I'm struck by, um, obviously I take a different view on suffering than on you do in some ways. And that is, um, I am reluctant to ever re think about redemptive suffering. I do think that we suffer. Um, I do think that that suffering comes from multiple sources. And I think the reason I'm reluctant to think about, to give redemptive suffering too big a place, one, because I think in Christianity, it's easy to go there, particularly for those who are suffering, and not suffering um, through decisions that they've made, and not even suffering because an individual did A, B, C, or D, but because there are systems in place which support the, the very deep suffering that individuals and groups experience. Mm -hmm. And that's where I become cautious. Not, uh, I'm not gonna throw it out the window totally, but that's where I become so, uh, cautious. I don't think that we become stronger through living, I don't think we become stronger or more empathic because we've suffered. I think and maybe this is what you were talking about in terms of the meaning making, mm -hmm. I think that, that that empathy or the capacity for it occurs because, to use your language of witnessing, um, someone witnessing with us. But I, I am pretty convinced that for many of our patients, it's not just that we witness, but that they, either because it's true, but also because they have combined with that a fantasy that our witnessing has feet. Mm -hmm. That it, it actually, we're doing something beyond the clinical room. Mm -hmm. Now that may be, well of course it's fantasy in many ways and none of us are you know, doing everything that we believe either we can do, should do, or would like to do. But I don't think it's just the the one-on-one -on -one empathy. And I have to say, that actually is a loss for me. Um, I mentioned that I trained at the um, Institute for Psychoanalysis in Chicago, but prior to that, I trained at the Center for Religion and Psychotherapy where cell psychology, classical cohut was, um, mm -hmm. you know, I sort of laughed when you said, well, maybe psychoanalysis is a religion for me. But after I laughed, I had a memory of being at a party with Celia Brickman. Um, and another of our colleagues, uh, Kenneth Crossman, and we were talking to Arnold and Connie Goldberg, 
and we were all quoting from Kohut as if it was the Bible. I'm, and when I say quoting, uh, I mean page. No. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not attributing to Celia um, that psychoanalysis is like a religion, but I certainly remember the thrill and um, the excitement of having those kind of conversations quoting that way, and the loss. Um, I, I yeah. still identify as self-psychologist, but the loss that then required me to write the book, to mm -hmm. really critically, to the, to the best of my ability, to read self-psychology again in light of the, the very things that we've been talking about. And I think it, ha it could have yeah. another reading. Someone else yeah. needs to do another one. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to, uh, if, I, if I might, respond to, uh, to your response regarding uh, suffering. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that, that I actually would ever use the phrase redemptive suffering. That, no, um, that, that's, that's painful to even, even hear. Mm -hmm. um, but I do believe in brokenness that we all experience many worse than others out of which meaning mm -hmm. and redemptive pursuits, the feat to change the conditions that brought about the suffering. Uh, that's, and I don't mm -hmm. think that's all too different mm -hmm. than uh, that kind of, of mm -hmm. thing, the feat. Um, the other thing, uh, your, your um, comment that you don't believe that empathy uh, really produces or, or offers uh, in the clinical relationship what um, at least I said in, in my paper. And where I think we would differ is that I believe the very act of mutual recognition that Jessica Benjamin talks about um, does something. That a person does not even feel like a person until their story is heard and understood and another person sees them as a person in their own right with their feelings and their subjectivity. And, and to me, that is the first step, after which there may be others, mm -hmm. such as feeling like that clinician wants to change the world. But that mutual recognition, to me, is absolutely pivotal for growth and development. Mm -hmm. I'd like to pose a couple of questions that interest me quite a bit these days on, on these diversity themes that we're considering. And I think they're complicated questions. Do you see ways in which therapy actually seems to make uh, clients more open to the other across difference? And when you see that happen, uh, how do you make sense of what it is therapeutically that's accomplishing that? And uh, are there ways that therapy could unfold that don't really seem to accomplish that, in other words, various forms of prejudice and bias are seemingly left in place. And what's the difference when therapy makes us more open to the other and when it doesn't? Well, let me, let me just start with what comes to my mind. Um, I, I, I really have enjoyed Peter Fonagy's recent concept of mentalization which I think is very similar to Jessica Benjamin's recognition and has a lot to do with what philosophers call theory of mind, yeah. that, that it's a developmental achievement to understand that even that another person has a separate subjectivity as opposed to you know, what you project on them is what you assume they're like. And I've often thought that Training as a psychotherapy is a lifelong process in being able to mentalize more fully the other. I don't think we ever understand the other fully. <laughs> it's always an in-process thing. And I think what Dr. Shepard has asked us to look at are and, and I think of this as exquisitely psychoanalytic. Psychoanalysis is about the things that are unconscious, that are often obvious but completely invisible. Mm -hmm. 
And among those are not just the sexuality and aggression that Freud and the early analysts talked about, or the narcissistic injuries that Kohut was able to talk about so beautifully, but issues of race and gender and privilege. And they're often part of what we can't fully feel our way into in another person. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I often have experiences where I thought I understood a person pretty well, and then something comes up that helps me mentalize them, another feature of them, in a way that somehow sheds light. And I, I think there's, there is something like what Grotstein calls a truth drive. Mm-hmm. You know, there, there's some way in which when you learn something that's suddenly conscious to you, about someone else's different experience, where you can recognize that, it just feels like you get it. I, it it's, very, it's very right-brained, I think. And I'm sure a lot of therapies go on where that doesn't happen very much, mm-hmm. because there's a collusion between both people to agree not to talk about certain elephants in the room that neither of them wants to talk about. Uh, So those are the first thoughts I have about the question that you've raised. You know, I I would add to that that I think, um, I, I don't think it's just around race, as you say, or gender or sexuality, but the, the kind of change that you've mentioned, like not just being open to the other, but becoming deeply aware of the ways in which we can't and don't want to be open to someone mm-hmm. uh, or someones, I think it requires, um, I think the first little vignette I used of the woman from Germany mm-hmm. just gives a taste of what one has to bear. Mm-hmm. Um, I have to say I've had experiences of people imagining me in ways that, even when I think about it now, are quite shocking to me. Mm-hmm. And presenting the information, you know, the, the session in supervision, and having the supervisor say something like, um, <laughs> I think I told this in, in um, the Danielson class, but something like, well, you must think of yourself that way, otherwise it would not mm. come up. And um, I wasn't sure I would actually graduate from the institute when I replied once that, that the fact that the patient and the supervisor's fantasies matched mm-hmm. didn't mean that, that mine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, that's un- <laughs> but, but what was helpful in that supervision is that I, I knew I had to ride that horse with that patient. And it was filled with that kind of ride. Um, So what does it look like when it begins to change? Just like I think becoming and being a therapist is lifelong, that kind of change is lifelong. Um, Just having someone get to the point where they hear their own either sexism or racism in the moment. Or that in a session, I hear like you did when you were reading your student's paper, oh wow, you know, how could I have that thought? I, I write about this stuff. I can't yeah. possibly. Yeah. Mm. So I, I, don't, I don't know what it looks like at the end because, you know, I think the end is when we're at the end. Mm. <laughs> 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 that <Well said>. end. <laughs> I guess for me, um, I, I try to enter each session and work with each patient as a bit piece Hmm. in an overall telos of God's longing to change the world. And right now, it is that person and me that are in the process of being changed. And part of that change is that we all will be our best selves, loving and giving to one another. And that, to me, is the, the ultimate goal. So as I look at that telos and look at how I am impacted by the patient, how I am learning about myself, because I'm a relational psychoanalyst, and I I do see 
that the therapy is co-constructed. Um, and as I get supervision, um, then I trust that, and as I pray, I do pray about my patients, I pray and I work at a growth and develop in, development, both in my patient and in myself, in our own trajectories that will have repercussions for other people across our lifespans. Mm -hmm. That's my goal. Yeah, I'm curious, when you were in training, both of you, when you were in mm -hmm. training, I remember hearing something like this, that racism or sexism, you know, something like, you know what, that's not what he or she came to treatment for. Um, if that, you know, if that gets nudged, that's nice, but that's not, that's not why they're here. So I'm wondering, hmm. was that a part of your treatment? I mean, you're a part of your training, and how did you... There's a Freudian slip. <laughs> <laughs> That'll become really interesting, won't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like we get them to come back down. <laughs> I withdraw the question. <laughs> I, I, was, I was not trained that way. I, I, I think, um, but I went to an institute that was, um, it was founded by Theodor Reich, who was a protege of Freud's, but um, emphasized uh, being surprised by the patient, letting the patient surprise you, mm -hmm. learning from the patient intuitive processes rather than the sort of authoritative, we know what this is and we have to interpret it to the patient. And I had a couple of African American teachers that wanted to bring these issues out. Uh, Henry Sindos was one of them who recently died in New York. Uh, Duncan Walton, my colleague in New Jersey, was another. So. Uh, and there were some religious people in my institute because the institute prided itself on going by Freud's original uh, idea that medical training was not necessarily the best training to be a therapist. It pushed you too much toward a kind of uh, foreclosed sense of uh, expert knowledge as opposed to um, training in all kinds of other arts, sciences, humanities that allowed you to have more um, empathy across various conditions. and. Uh, Jerry Gargiulo had been a Catholic priest, and he was my te one of my teachers. Mm -hmm. Alan Rowland, who's one of the first people who talked about the mm -hmm. psychology of Eastern people psychoanalytically, um, was one of my teachers. So I, I thought of psychoanalysis. I was reading Robert Coles's work, who was talked right. about by Thomas Cottle, mm -hmm. so I, and I thought I thought all of that was psychoanalytic. That, mm -hmm. um, so I didn't get that stuff about race and gender or sick or um, it, in fact there were there were people and this is back in the early 70s that were not exactly out in terms of their sexuality but they certainly weren't explicitly homophobic or heterosexist they would bring up the possibility that maybe this person um, would be better served by becoming comfortable with the sexuality that they have. Uh, Robert Robertiello was one of those people, for example. So I, looking back on it, I think I was very lucky because I got a less conventional mm -hmm. version of psychoanalytic training with more of the radical um, whatever is unconscious, whatever is important to your patient, you better not only look at that, but look at your resistances Sorry, <laughs> to um, Mm -hmm. to wanting to look at that. So I think I was very fortunate that way. We were um, immersed in these kinds of issues and questions. One of our first, my husband and I both went through NYU postdoc. Um, one of our first courses was with Jessica Benjamin. So we really got into mm -hmm. some of those issues of, of, of sexism and um, and, you know, it was really uh, quite common to, to talk about, to um, question yourself about these issues. What was not common was to religion and spirituality. Mm -hmm. That was the other 
Mm -hmm. So that's why it's exciting for me mm -hmm. that we can talk about this final taboo topic. Um, it, it, in certain ways, was I was uh, almost, I stayed, I had a low profile. Like, I don't want anybody to know that, you know, I was one of them. And, uh, <laughs> and it really was very comforting that then um, your spirituality also was open for discussion and interrogation. Mm -hmm. um, it was brought into the fold along with gender, sex, race, ethnicity, all of that. Mm -hmm. And that was a corrective, I think, the relational movement applied to the, you know, I go to occasional meetings at the New York or at the American Psychoanalytic and I'm just struck by how these are white men, MDs between 60 and 80, and everybody else is an exception. And that is a very common psychoanalytic subculture. It's not the one that I personally came from. Mm -hmm. I wondered your thoughts about training in these areas in terms of social, cultural, spiritual identity, these aspects that are often split off. Um, what are your thoughts about the training and formation of therapists, either in graduate settings or beyond, where uh, folks can continue to work on their awareness of self and other? Um, do you have thoughts of things you've seen done training-wise that seem helpful, um, that you're encouraged by? things in your own practice of growing in these areas that you could share or people that want to take next steps? Well, I don't think we put, in psychology programs anyway, nearly enough emphasis on personal exploration. Uh, I've been condoling with your director of training here about how bad the American Psychological Association credentialing process is when they want to, you know, a credit a program. It's all about how many credits did you have in developmental psychology and so forth. And I, I think we ought to be speaking out loud and clear about the importance of people's personal therapy, but also at least giving them opportunities to process stuff. A, like my colleague at Rutgers, Nancy Boyd Franklin, does a course on diversity where she has students not just read about different diverse groups, but she has every student talk about their family of origin, their religious background, their ethnic background, um, what's distinctive about them, uh, how that might impact how they hear their own patients. Mm -hmm. And the students love that course because it, it's about real stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, but our students also complain that they don't get enough of that kind of training. And I think we're in danger now. We're getting all this pressure to, you know, to get more statistics and more experimental design and more training in these uh, specific intellectual areas. And the whole exploratory, self-disclosing, comparing process is um, less emphasized, and that's a shame. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that one of the pivotal times in my life and my husband's life was when we studied in community in, in Switzerland. And that left its mark on us in terms of learning mm -hmm. to relate to quite a diverse group of people from all over the world. And so as we've been, um, we've established this institute in which psychoanalysis and theology um, are, are both taught, uh, we do it in community. Hmm. And we also have a contemplative component so that not only do people learn classic psychoanalysis, they learn all the things that you're supposed to learn over the three years, um, but they also have it interwoven with philosophy and theology, but they live in together uh, for a week in the summer and weekends through the year, and they have, uh, after the didactic, they'll have times of spiritual direction where they will reflect 
on the impact of the material on their lives, on their, do they split? How is the splitting manifest? Well, when you're living in community, that kind of stuff emerges. So there's time to process in that setting. And then, of course, they have their individual psychotherapy. So that's one of the ways that we are attempting mm. to um, not only uh, teach the facts, but get at the values and get the values down in the soul so that, mm. so that it, it really transforms people. You know, I'm. Uh, what comes to my mind is the fact that the Danielson exists, which I think it has. It's, it has the structure, just for that. Mm -hmm. I think of the Center for Religion and Psychotherapy. Um, but with your program and both with the Danielson and the Center for Religion and Psychotherapy, it occurs to me that um, those are extra are. Uh, I don't know how else to put it, but beyond your mm -hmm. degree, particularly mm -hmm. in this uh, licensing. Um, I, when I came up, um, licensing was not a reality until just after I graduated from the center. And so I do think that sh has shifted so much or shaped the current context of training today. Um, and I think that schools of theology are wonderful places and still have uh, spaces to actually do this in the context of a degree. Mm -hmm. uh, outside of that, then we need your institute, the center, the Danielson. I, it's hard for me to imagine it happening in a robust way, just as you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. This might be a good point to transition to questions from the audience. I think that issues, especially of um, race and uh, sexuality and gender orientation, perhaps a little bit less. You know, sex was part of Freud's outlook, and so that has always had a central place in the training of psychoanalysts. But there is a tendency, even now, I think, that when we talk about race and ethnicity, it's sort of like we're talking about something out there, and how might we relate to it? And there is this language that has come up about the, the psychoanalytic third and stuff like that. And I'd like to suggest that things like uh, race, um, well, let's just take race as a very good example, doesn't exist out there. And that those of us who have white skins and think we don't have a race, um, we're living in some kind of denial. Uh, this is as much a race as anything else is. And that we learn about this in the same way, and we absorb this in the same way as we absorb everything else from our earliest object relations. So to think of it as something that exists out there, I think, does us a great disservice. It's from our earliest years that we're learning about who we are um, sexually, uh, relationally, racially, and so forth. Um, uh, and there was one, one other thing I wanted to say here. Yeah, and I think that we see this, that um, uh, we're still in this process that it requires Phyllis to be at the podium before mm -hmm. this topic comes up, even though, as I say, none of us are without race. Um, and I want to also get back to this uh, issue of suffering. Um, there is, I think, a great difference in suffering which all of us undergo and which all of our patients come to see us for. And suffering that is part of the social structure that we live in and that for some people is 
inevitable and for others of us is for that very reason invisible because it is not in inevitable for us and so I think that there's a great deal of education that has to be done and once again not an education of something that is out there. If I was born into a well-off family and I went to a good school uh, and I had certain kind of friends or whatever, that's something that I take in intrapsychically as much as anything else. Um, first, I just want to thank you all for sharing this discussion. It's been inspiring. And I'm curious, as each of you spoke about the constant process of becoming more open to the other, um, I'm curious how that process impacts your understanding of the divine in your own spiritual process, whether those two are related and how they might be related. Well, I'll, I'll respond to that. I, I, uh, I had to teach Beyon this last weekend. And um, Beyon, as Salman Akhtar mentioned, talks about O oh, as ultimate truth. And that I guess my, my thinking is that the more I am open spiritually to the divine, the more I need to be open to that aspect of the other that is truly there, that I can see the truth of who that person is. That is absolute truth, and the other person is a fractal of hmm. that truth. So to me, truth is a spiritual concept. Hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I would agree. It was a powerful experience to have that sense. Uh, with some, especially people who are very narcissistically defended, my criterion for a good session is like one moment of authenticity. <laughs> and when it comes, I feel very spiritually enlivened. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I want to... Um add something to this question. Uh, I think that, um, you know, Philip Bromberg's idea of standing in the spaces amongst your various dissociated selves or preferred selves and bringing all of one's self-states as best as one can under the same umbrella and thinking of parts of yourself that you despise as not me and sort of bringing those in to be who you are as well. This process in us, I think, is crucial as, as analysts or therapists. That's something that we have to, I think, undergo and process and, and live and evolve with if we're to um, hope that our patients as well can experience the other in themselves Without, without fear and loathing. And um, I think that's a way to be whole that we can offer. I wanted to say, um, in, in terms of the divine or my experience of the divine, um, maybe this is standing in a dissociative place, but um, for me, any sense that I have or where I would use that language is is an experience that comes and goes. And what I mean by that is that I don't enter at that space. I, um, I, it's almost as if a cloud, a beautiful cloud, takes shape in, let's say, in a session where someone experiences, for instance, their own suffering that they've not been able to know before or someone knows that their suffering is not you know i'm not crazy something actually happened mm -hmm. um that someone 
puts the pieces together and begins to form a meaningful life for him or herself out there. There is sort of a, um, cloud isn't the right word, a mist that sort of flows for me. It may not for the other person. But that is not a mist that is permanent, you know, in terms of the divine. Does that mean that if there is something bigger, larger than us that one might call the divine, um, well, I'll just say I don't know what that means. I only know what in the context of, for me, community, in the context of being with others in meaningful ways, doing with others in terms of making change, that is very spiritual for me. Um, sometimes that can happen in a religious context, like a church service, but more often it happens someplace else. question of all of you if possible and it has to do with um, in your careers if you have been up against um, uh, patients that have come to you and want to know a lot about your spiritual religious background and make it very clear um, to you that their their belief system is very upsetting to you or not outside of the range of your ethics. And I, I don't know if I'm being clear about this question, but it's happened a few times and it happened to me on Friday during a consult. <laughs> <laughs> a patient saw something I was reading inadvertently and basically started grilling me and, and kicked me out, essentially. Um, so I'm just wondering if you're sitting with someone that it's, it's almost painful for you to hear, even though they are legitimately in pain, but almost painful to hear their, where they're coming from. How do you handle that? <laughs> Tell me, please. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've had that happen to me in terms of religious beliefs. Um, many of my patients who think their religious beliefs are probably quite different from mine, haven't grilled me about mine. They, they seem more to want to check me out whether I'm open to hearing theirs. But where it has happened is politically. Mm -hmm. um, I'm somewhat left of center, and I've occasionally had an ideological right winger as a patient. And, uh, you know, struggle with that. I, I remember there's a story Ralph Greenson tells about a patient of his who said to him, well, of course, you as a lib liberal Democrat wouldn't agree with so-and-so. And Greenson said, how do, you, how do you make the assumption that I'm a liberal Democrat? Because he'd been trying to be very neutral. And, and the patient said, well, every time I say something um, that's sort of in that territory, you nod. <laughs> but when I say something that comes more that's from the right. right, you start interpreting my resistance to something else, you know? So I, I don't think it's possible to be neutral, as the relational community has made really clear. But I have run into patients who worry that they will lose their soul mm -hmm if they let uh, this, you know, compassion-oriented, <laughs> liberal influence them. And it's really, all, all you can do is help them express what they're afraid of. And, uh, and I'm sure sometimes that won't work because you're too much the other for them and they can't quite bear it. Does that fit your experience? You were nodding. I had a patient once bring a Bible, and I, I believe the Bible was this big. <laughs> it, it looked that way to me. A red underline, you, you know, the red letter edition. And what he wanted was for us to pick a Bible verse. He had researched me. I taught at a seminary. This seemed reasonable to him. Um, that we would pick 
a verse, flip the Bible open, you know, the sort of bam. Okay, there's your verse. Let's work with that today. And um, I did everything that I was trained to do to explore the meaning of it, what were his hopes. You know, I tried. Um, <laughs> it, it, it didn't work. <laughs> he left. He really needed someone to provide a kind of structure that actually, you know, I probably still wouldn't do it, but I actually understand it a little bit differently now that he needed that. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just that he wanted to grill me or he needed that. I couldn't provide it. There are limitations. I, I have um, often had people, as they're wanting to come into the practice, ask, you know, what church do you go to? Do you believe in the literal inspiration of scripture? That kind of thing. So that's been, it, it's not as frequent now, but early on that was, that was the case. And I, uh, my, my response is, is sufficiently succinct um, so that I can get the person into the office and that they can know me as a person and feel safe with me. But the way that I look at these kinds of questions is fundamentalism of any sort needs to be worked through, needs to be analyzed and worked through. And someone can come to me as a fundamentalist atheist, mm -hmm. a fundamentalist Christian, a fundamentalist anything. And that closed-mindedness needs to be addressed as such. The distinctives really are secondary. Um, and, uh, and that's the goal that I try to try to have when I'm working with them. And we have many, many who know that we've written on religious topics and come to us because we work in an open-minded fashion in which we respect um, the sensibilities of the people that come to us. Um. I want to express my appreciation to each and all of you. Um, I've developed a habit, it may be a bad habit, and it started when I was doing a lot of supervision, to wonder with somebody coming in, where are they working? And so I would turn to you, and each of you has had to prepare a document to present. And I'm curious, as you were in the process of doing that, if there were a question coming to your mind about where it is that you're working, that as much as these ideas are gathering and taking shape, they're also on the edge of something that you're not yet clear about. And could we participate with you where you're working? That's such a good question. I, I think I, I, well, I had a very ex interesting experience writing the paper, which was that I wrote it in about a day. And this is not, I mean, I usually take a long time to write. And there are all kinds of citations I worry about. Just sort of poured out. Um, I found that very interesting in itself. But what I saw myself looking back at the paper was that there was a lot more about the ethical dimension of religion and its impact on me. And I feel that my relationship to spirituality is still very primitive. Um, and I think that's probably the next thing I want to understand more about myself. I sort of understand how my values evolved via the religious lessons I got. My relationship to the divine, as I experience spirituality, I think is the next step for me. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for that, that uh, really good question. I think that where I'm at, both in writing this paper and preparing a couple other lectures is, um, working on the split uh, that religion has had from everything else and bringing it in as something that people can look at as um, a narrative and a worldview and a perspective. 
So I'm, I'm, I'm really attempting to work on words like witnessing, salvation. Um, my lectures in the future are on those, those words, conversion. Mm -hmm. How can we talk to patients that have used these words in very fixed ways and broaden their understanding of what does it mean to be saved? Saved from what? Saved to what? Um, and, and translate some of this language into something very usable in a clinical setting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. <laughs> My office is right next door to this man, so. He's <laughs> 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 driving me crazy. Um, <laughs> 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 My mind has gone in several directions, and one, it involves um, some of the things you've just mentioned. How do we understand some of the theological language that both patients bring, but that, that we write about it in a, a different way? That's one. But in particular, the, the place where my mind is really going that I alluded to in the paper is this one chapter of my new book on cyber religion and an African-American experience. I'm not quite sure why, but it has really captured my attention. And I, I'm already beginning to see, see some things that I need to write about but um, I don't know if Dean Moore is here, but periodically she'll say, what are, you, what are you finding? What are you seeing? And I can't really say to her what I'm seeing, but I know I'm seeing it. Um, so that's where I am in that I hope it's a liminal space that's. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd like to thank each of you for entering this space with us and sharing so much. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.